How's it going, y'all? Another day in paradise on the Bunk Bed Breakdowns channel. We're back. Man, you know what? I woke up today and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to be a boring ass day because, you know, we're kind of slow at work. I uh, had some meetings, but slow at work. For the most part, everyone's gone for the holidays. I'm still grinding because I'm a fucking grunt at my company. Um, so I'm just out here grinding. I'm, I'm a little bit bored. I'm, I'm scrolling through my Twitter timeline. And what do you know? Man, we get blessed. We get blessed because Nick Whalen comes across my timeline. And, uh, you know, if you guys aren't on my Twitter account, go go over there and check it out. Uh, I'm not, you know, not the biggest fan of Nick Whalen. We put out some fake shit and uh, we expose him and put him in a body bag. That's what we do here on Bunk Bed Breakdowns. We put other people in body bags. We put Nick in body bags. He puts me in body bags. Noah puts both of us in body bags. It's a body bag roulette out here on the fucking Bunk Bed Breakdowns channel. But enough about that, man. We were going to title this episode Nick Will and Body Bag, but we didn't do it because nobody fucking knows who he is on Twitter. So that video would have fucking tanked. So that's not what we're going to do. We're, what we're going to do, though, is address the questions at hand, man, because it's about time we reach back out in the community. We had a couple of these Q&As in the offseason, but then the season kind of took hold. And, you know, we had to cover all the content, the playoffs and all that shit. But it's good to get back into things and just talk to the folks, man. Answer the questions at hand. What do you all need? We're here for you. We're going to get into that this episode, a couple other things. But, man, before we do that, Noah, dude, how's it going? How's it going over there? It's going all right. You know, Christmas is around the corner. It's the holiday season. Uh, th things are looking up for the kid. I know Twitter, there's been a little bit of shysty action going on between you and some other people. Man, I think the real solution is just follow 69 people. Keep your circle small. Just don't really yeah. put out dumb takes of your own and then <laughs> own them. I know you did the, uh, that this past week. You kind of owned up to your takes. I'm on a new kick. I'm putting pinned tweets on my account that were bad takes. I have one up there where, like, <laughs> the Chargers suck. They took Herbert, Brandon Ayuk stinks. That's my pinned tweet. I'm like, I got nothing to hide behind. I'd rather people, you know, if I was following somebody like me, who doesn't take themselves too seriously i'd be like you know I, I like somebody who owns their mistakes and if they are right they're not going to brag about it i'm the epitome of that if i got something right like i care but i'm not going to bring it up if i got something wrong man shit all over me i mean i told people to sell derrick henry for two straight years and now i'm out here like top five dynasty running back going by him so i'm kind of a fraud in that sense but at the same time i think you know it's it's the season of giving so i'm giving you guys some takes to throw back in my face and i'm, I'm being completely out in the open with them yeah, I love that. I'm a, I'm gonna go back and do that. I'm gonna pin my hall of shame to my Twitter because uh, I got some bad takes, man. Justin Herbert funny, I was on that one too. Funny enough, Henry. I had the I don't know if it's funnily enough or funny enough, whatever it is. I'm no wordsmith. It's funny enough, dude. It's funny but, enough, dude. You guys know what? No, let's let's start a fucking GoFundMe for Noah to to learn how education. to spell and read because you can't you can't spell quarterback and running back. Now, quarterback <laughs> is good. There's making no up, space. Making running up back. words, making up words over here. No, but funny enough, my pin tweet was actually our video we did on Clyde Edwards Hilaire, and I was talking him up, and then he ends up being like the worst running back. So maybe I was already on the train <laughs> of pinning bad tweets, but now we're going full steam ahead. I might just tweet bad things that I expect to be bad for next year, just so I have more material to pin to my account. You know what we'll do? We'll do a fucking cold takes episode. We'll do a cold takes episode of all of our all of our freezing cold takes, and it's gonna be a good one. It's gonna be a nice laugh. For sure. And you guys in the comments either like send us a link or like dm us cold takes that we had because yeah, yeah, we had yeah. a lot and we can remember a lot of them but we don't remember all of them or if you want to put yeah. like a timestamp in a video that you like really remember what we said was terrible i mean we all know the whole justin herbert stuff you don't have to tweet the videos of me like reacting <laughs> to herbert looking this way and being like oh shit we just took this guy like some other ones other than herbert maybe Ayuk because i think we we have those like branded in our memory if you want to do that then maybe next week when the season's over week 17 only frauds play that week unless you're watching you're not a fraud we <laughs> appreciate your support uh if that's the case we might just do a cold takes like nomination show and then have you guys vote in the comments and we'll see we, we'll see who prevails in the in the hall of worst takes yeah it's it's gonna be a funny one uh so make sure you guys tune in for that but uh man before we get started no what time is it what time is it dude uh i think it's time to hit the intro hit it no i'll let you kick it off with the questions and we'll kind of just get into them bit by bit and we'll try and give you our perspective and you know add on some 
ancillary information that we think is important on top of it. So first up, that's, that's fucking ridiculous. Now I'm gonna have to read these <laughs> words that people wrote. This is real tough. All right, we got our guy ATM and all these are from our discord in the bunk bed breakdown Q and a channel, but this one's actually from the goat tier 45 bucks a month. So we really appreciate your guys support. He asked how much do Chark and Visca move up in your dynasty ranks? He's on a first name and last name basis. That is DJ Chark and LaVisca Chanel. How much do they move up in your dynasty ranks? If Jacksonville lands Trevor Lawrence, they have an inside track on the number one pick now. And we're not going to cover just those two guys. I think as a whole, we should cover what's going to happen in Jacksonville with this move, because obviously Justin Fields is a great quarterback. And we thought him going there is a huge bump up over whatever frauds that they have in Jacksonville, whether it's Jake Luton, who I forgot was actually a starter this year. I was like looking to this question. I'm like, I know they had three guys. I forgot who number two was. It was Minshew, Luton, and Mike Glennon, long neck bastard. Uh, they all kind of, I like Minshew, but it's he's no competition when it comes to Justin Fields. So I thought that was going to help him out. But we know what Trevor Lawrence is. Trevor Lawrence, uh, as you have touted, as many people have touted, he's like the best quarterback prospect since like Andrew Luck. And it seems like every year somebody will say that, but he's legitimately been heralded that for, it seems like half a decade now. Ever since he was in high school all the way up until now, it seems like he was supposed to be the next big thing. Uh, everybody was trying to buy in on Denzel Mims because he was going to go to the Jets. If you're buying any Jets pieces because of a speculative quarterback being drafted there, you necessarily have to be higher on Jacksonville pieces because Jacksonville pieces last year with Minshew and Foles, DJ Chark put up a thousand yards in his second year after we thought he was dead in the water because that system is just a little bit better than what the Jets got going on. Jay Gruden wants to throw the ball. Adam Gase wants to ruin his team, both going 0-15 and, and then winning a game or whatever to getting them out of the number one contention. I think overall, I don't think it's too brash to say their ceilings can both be like top 24 guys. I think right now, I haven't moved it up because of this um, this draft, whatever, the draft swap of 2-1. to one. I think I have like Chenault around 41 and Chark uh, – high 30s as in like 30 31 32 something like that I think honestly if he lands there and it's still not it's still up in the air because what if Jacksonville wins what if the Jets lose out which they probably will they get him so it once we know that the number one overall pick I think that's when the rankings will have to be fully adjusted I could see Chark easily moving inside the top 24 maybe even a top 20 option because we've seen his ceiling in an offense that won't be as good as it's going to be with Trevor Lawrence there and LaVisca Chenault for as bad as a year it seems like he's having I mean, he came into the year with a hamstring injury. He's always kind of banged up, and he's still on pace for like 750, 800 yards from scrimmage, basically having a down, uh, a lesser Debo Samuel rookie season. We know what type of player he is. So I think the receiver's there. The upside's going to be immense if Trevor Lawrence is there because we know he has the accuracy, and we know that offense can't get much worse than it is right now if they make that quarterback improvement. Yeah, it's it's going to be, man, it's going to be a beautiful sight, I think. It really upgrades everyone. But, I mean, I was already upgrading anyone, everyone because I was assuming Justin Fields is going there. So, it's not – I don't really think I'm moving, like, DJ Chark, like, too much up my rankings or, like, Lavisca Chanel too much up my rankings. I was already assuming Justin Fields is going to go there. And I like Justin Fields, the prospect. He's not as good as Trevor Lawrence. But for fantasy-wise, you know, he could be uh, – I know there's, like – people have been kind of voicing the concerns recently over, like, Justin Fields and, you know – you know, potentially Zach Wilson going ahead of them. Like, you know, maybe that happens, right? Like Mitch Trubisky got drafted ahead of fucking Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson being the glaringly obvious one to me. Uh, So, you know, NFL teams are going to do what they do. But, you know, what it means, though, is I think people are going to, like, overreact on the jet side because like immediately after after like that happened people are like well you know now they're going to keep sam darnold and like draft and trade down and then draft the no line like no no dude like you don't have a quarterback in sam darnold you just keep fucking swinging for the swinging for a quarterback until you get one if that's zach wilson take him if that's justin fields take him i don't care who it is take somebody at the quarterback position it's not every year you get to pick with the top two pick granted, you know, the jets make it look easy, but it's actually not that easy. Like Miami dolphins, people said they were tanking uh, for Tua and, you know, look how that turned out. Like they, they were not able to get there. So as much as like people think it's easy to tank, like players want to fucking win, right? Like veteran players aren't sitting on your team being like, Oh yeah, let me, let me tank this so that I can like, you know, make the team better for the next guy that comes like, no, don't give a fuck, man. Veterans want to win. Like they want to win games. Everyone wants to win games. Like people have pride. These are NFL players. They got pride in their game they got pride in themselves and they're not going to be out there tanking for a fucking adam case so i think don't overreact there like i think the jets are definitely going to take a quarterback still and then even if they don't right they they can trade back for a huge huge haul that would be a mistake because you still need a quarterback but they could trade back for a huge haul um and but as long as adam gase is there man it's it's just like not fucking good what what i will say 
is if they take Justin Fields, I think the gap between Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields widened a little bit, a little bit for me. And and the gap between the wide receivers and Denzel Mims and someone like DJ Chark and Levis Chanel widened a little bit for me because Trevor Lawrence is a better passer, much better passer. He's also a really good uh, runner on the ground, but more importantly, he's a better passer for his wide receivers. So, you know, in terms of their value, like DJ Chark, I think people might overreact a bit, right? I, I, won't, I wouldn't go out and try and get him right now. I would still wait until the rookie draft and, you know, a day before the draft, you're on the clock or whatever it is. Um, I bet money you could flip like a mid to late first for DJ Chark. Uh, I think somebody you can go out and buy and should go out and buy though. And it's our favorite boy, James Robinson. I know people are still concerned. He's an undrafted free agent. If you wipe that away, something that happened like nine months ago, if you wipe away the draft capital, you just look at the resume, the size, the usage, the production. Honestly, he's had a better rookie season than every other rookie running back in this class, whether it's DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, Jonathan Taylor's starting to come on, but he really doesn't rival his production. You know, James Robinson is a top five running back on a team led by three different quarterbacks, no defense, and a mediocre offensive line. Once Trevor Lawrence comes into town, even if it's Justin Fields, that team is going to be in so many more scoring situations, more scoring opportunities. He's still going to be the guy in the backfield. I don't care if they add – the only way I'd be nervous is if they add a running back day one or day two. But seeing as how many holes that they have and seeing how much they've – how much stock they've put into James Robinson, cutting their former first overall pick, uh, 104 overall, their first round pick, to give him the reins and the fact that he took over and has looked great and has held up – perfectly fine to this point. I know he got banged up this past week. I'm not sure if he's playing this week, but you know, even then like 15 straight weeks of production, I don't think he's going to be replaced. If he is replaced, I think it's going to be by some like shitty free agent that he's going to beat out or some garbage third down back like Chris Thompson, who he also beat out. So if you can buy James Robinson right now, go for it because he's been a top five running back this year. And he's inside my top 10 for dynasty just because. Whoa, whoa, hold up. Let's not 100%. brush past that. Top 10 for Dynasty. All right, let's 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 dig into that a little bit more. Top what, 10 uh, Dynasty running backs, not top 10 overall, if that's what you thought. And, and I, I know, but still, who, who do you – so who, who what do you have it? How do you have it ranked? All right, let me let me open them up right now. Let's go a little bit behind the scenes. Hopefully, I don't have them like 11, so I look like a fraud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> James Robs. Okay, I lied. He's 12. But I have okay. – inside track, I have CMC, Alvin Kamara, mm-hmm. Alvin Cook, Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry – JT, Barkley, Swift, Gibson, Akers, Dobbins, Robinson. Wow. Okay. That's so that means you got, As you got what him. you got Zeke behind them. You got Jacobs behind them, right? Mm-hmm. Joe Mixon you, behind them. Miles you got Sanders Joe behind Mixon them, behind them. You got Miles Sanders behind them. Damn. 100%. You got, you got Austin Eckler, the God behind him. I'm telling you right now, I'm not sure if it's because his hamstring came clean off the bone. Like Will Fuller, he has not looked impressive at all. I know he's catching a bunch of passes, but I just, yeah. He does not look like he has the juice, and this offense looked better, crazy enough, when yeah. fucking Kalen Balaj was back there. I know he's probably going to get healthy and he's going to look better again, but he's also just not getting goal line touches. He hasn't scored a goal line touchdown since week four of last year, yeah. which was the last game Melvin Gordon missed. So he's just not the goal line guy, and the fact that they drafted uh, Joshua Kelly and they're still using totally Kalen Balaj gives me a little bit of worry about his scoring upside. That's totally fair. What What about like if, if Dak comes back, though, Dak plus Zeke? You would, you, would you still take James Robinson? I have them back to back and it's a cop out to say they're in a tier, but just we've not that I've, I don't know. Like we've seen so many running backs around Zeke's age with as many touches mm-hmm. as he's had kind of fall off a cliff. And I know he hasn't had any huge injuries. He's had like a calf injury this year and like other stuff that's kept him out a little bit. So I'm not going to say he's completely falling off and he was good when Dak was there, but a lot of it was through the air, getting a whole bunch of catches, whole bunch of receptions. If Mike McCarthy's gone, is that offense going to stay the same? I know there can be a lot of scoring opportunities and such, but I think the age discrepancy, the fact that he's also James Robinson is going to get a quarterback upgrade as will Ezekiel Elliott next year. And the fact that James Robinson's fantasy production was basically rivaling Ezekiel Elliott, like for the full season, uh, Ezekiel Elliott with Dak was basically rivaling what James Robinson has done the full season in his shitty situation. Uh, I, I would take James Robinson ahead of him. I'm just, I'm that confident. And it doesn't seem like, I know Tony Pollard is not going to completely push Ezekiel Elliott for touches and be like a 50, 50 split next year, but they know they have a legit guy behind Zeke. Whereas in Jacksonville, there's really nobody to steal the job from James Robinson, or at least push him for touches. Got it. Yeah. I mean, look, that's totally fair. Like James Robinson's a God. If, if James Rob, if they get through the next draft season, right. And they don't add uh, like any, top running backs and like call it the top first or second round 
then James Robinson value is going to skyrocket, right? So if you're going to make really that... that deep of a running back class, if it's not like Gainwell, Javante, Trev's ETN, or Najee Harris, I mean, who's who's really going to push him for touches? Well, I mean, if, if draft capital comes, if they take someone in the second round, like I think they'll they'll probably do it. But then again, they took AJ Dillon in the second round. The guy doesn't even fucking step on the field, so who knows? <laughs> but yeah, we'll see. I mean, if it's not if it's not Najee, Etienne, Javante, uh, I'm not that concerned. You know, if Kenneth Gainwell comes, I'll be a little bit concerned because he'll definitely eat into a lot of that receiving work, and he's actually a really good player. Uh, but yeah, point taken. I mean, dude, James Robinson, the hero, the fantasy hero, and I, I get it. He didn't put up that many points. This week, but if you guys saw the game, it's a fucking miracle. We put up any points at all. They got dumpstered by the Ravens. Not so. having a punter is way more important than I thought it was because they could <laughs> yeah. not get out of their own half of the field. And it's like, okay, we can't punt. So just score on us again, Lamar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So look, man, it's bright spots ahead for that team. Not only do they have a lot of uh, young studs and DJ Chark, LaVisca Chanel, James Robinson, they're loaded with draft capital. Uh, so that team is going to, you know, similar to how we saw uh, Miami turn around really quick. If they get the right GM, the right coach in place, you can see a really quick turnaround for that team within the next few years, especially with Trevor Lawrence at the helm. Like that is a game changer for that squad. So I'm really excited about the Jacksonville Jaguars and, and I'm, I'm bullish, bullish on this offense with Trevor Lawrence coming in. hundred uh, percent. Somebody that we were both bullish on. We have a question from Pyro King. It's actually two different players. We'll cover this one a little bit more quickly than the last topic. What are Christian Kirk and Cortland Sutton's dynasty values going into next season? I think this is kind of a crazy dichotomy. I'm not sure why he brought, I'm sure he has like both of them on his roster. He wants to see our outlook. We'll touch on Christian Kirk first. For me, he's, he's kind of fallen off the map. I mean, his, at some point, your analytical profile coming out of college can only go so far. Like Terry McLaurin, we were nervous year one to year two, like, can this be sustained? Turns out he's just really fucking good at football. Mm -hmm. Christian Kirk, you had a great breakout age. You had a college dominator. You were very versatile in college returning kicks. It's your third year in the league and you really haven't made your mark outside of that one game in like week six where we thought he was gonna be legit, hasn't done anything. My issue with Christian Kirk is he can be as talented as he wants. He hasn't flashed it. And, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, for as good as he's been, it's still his first year there. And I still think that the role he has, this is basically his floor for the remainder of his contract. They're going to use him heavily. Like Larry Fitzgerald's 30 something years old, still seeing almost as many targets as Christian Kirk. DeAndre Hopkins, like 28 in the prime of his career. He's not going to ever see like less than 10 targets a game on average for the rest of the time. He's in Arizona. And the other issue I have with Christian Kirk too, is like Kyler Murray really isn't or at least at this point, hasn't shown to be extremely accurate. So even if he's seeing like six, seven targets a game with the types of targets that Christian Kirk is seeing down the field, like what are the chances that most of those are going to be catchable? And even if they are, we haven't seen Christian Kirk really turn that into production. And, you know, I tried to excuse away what he did early in his career because he played with Josh Rosen. He played with terrible quarterbacks and Sammy Sleeves, uh, believe it or not, his first, I think it was his first game in the NFL. And then second year, right, rookie quarterback, rookie coach in Cliff Kingsbury, I made that excuse. Now what? You have a really good quarterback there. I know I just kind of disparaged his accuracy, but you have Kyler Murray, who's a pretty good quarterback. You have Cliff Kingsbury in his second year, and you have your third year exposed to break out, and he's really not doing anything. So for me, Christian Kirk, uh, he's in my mid-40s for my wide receiver rankings. And I know we like to say, oh, wide receiver is deep, and that's because there's a lot of good receivers. Honestly, for him, it's just like I don't really have all too much trust in him. And I would, if I could get off of him for like a second-round pick, if anybody's willing to pay that price because they believe in uh, the bar graphs and everything that's on player profiler, not disparaging that side at all. But if somebody like buys that heavily into the analytics this late into his career, I'm jumping off the ship because I just don't see it happening at this point. Yeah. Did you say wide receiver 41? I think I have him right there as well. I said and mid 40. So like four, I think it's like 44, 45. Yeah, I have him as like low 40s, I think. Um, and it is, he has definitely had a bit of a disappointing season. I mean, he had that stretch in the middle where it was looking like he's getting volume, like averaging like six to eight targets a game. Uh, but, you know, he's kind of like showing a little bit of his true colors, right? He's, he's just that wide receiver three. I think, you know, one thing to be lo looking out for is if Larry Fitz leaves, but I'm always very, very like cautious about following that narrative of wide receivers leaving because always get replaced by other wide receivers. Yeah, so like they drafted good, Andy man. Isabella too. They drafted Keyshawn Johnson. Like they have shown that they yeah. want to add pieces. Yeah, and this class is extremely deep at wide receivers. So I agree with you. If you can get out for a second round pick in super flex drafts, I would definitely do that because I was looking at my ranks. And if you guys go to the Market Watch Mondays episode, I went through the top 24 players and the wide receivers is really, really deep. And there's a lot of talents that I'd, I'd rather bet on and kind of refresh and uh, refresh my bet and just like swing again. So if you can get a second round pick, definitely do that. Um, if you can get 
maybe maybe even like a super early third, like a 3.01, 3.02, because like I said, it is a very, very deep class. And if you're in tight end premium leagues, like that's where you'll be able to get like, I think you can get a guy like a, you know, like a Elijah Moore from Ole Miss, for example, would be a good pivot. You know, he also has a very great analytical profile. He's a bit on the smaller side and he's like a slot receiver too. And it'd be good to kind of get that reset to see where he lands. But yeah, I agree with you. Second round pick, definitely trade. Potentially, potentially even like an early third or a couple third round picks as well would be fine. And then even even just pivoting, using him as like an add-on piece to pivot into like another uh, better wide receiver by like taking like Christian Kirk plus someone and, you know, trading up. So yeah, I think those trading are up to maybe a guy like Cortland Sutton. I went through my rankings. I moved him up fairly high. Wide receiver 24. To me, it's just like we've seen – a guy like Tim Patrick, who he's pretty athletic, but he's like 28 years old and somehow only his third year in the league. So I don't know how that works out. He came into the league really late or he was a super old senior or whatever. He, to me, he's shown that Cortland Sutton, despite bad quarterback play, will be able to produce in this offense. Tim Patrick is on pace for 58 catches, 879 yards and nine touchdowns ever since Sutton left. And that's including the game where they had fucking Kendall Higdon not throwing the ball. So those numbers are kind of deflated. He should be around like a thousand receiving yards and whatever. But what it tells me is like Cortland Sutton, when he was on the field, right? It's not like he had the best quarterbacks either. He played with three different quarterbacks his second year in the league with Case Keenum, Brandon Allen, Drew Locke. None of those guys are good. Hopefully, and most likely, none of those guys will be starting next year because it looks like they're going to be a top 15, top 16 pick. I'm not sure what type of capital they have to be able to move up, but hopefully even like a Kyle Trask or a Mac Jones, if they fall and, you know, they're six, five and white. So I think John Elway would be very happy with them. Uh, I think no matter what quarterback that they get, even if it is Drew Locke, we've seen him produce the Drew Locke to me, Cortland Sutton is going to be the alpha on this team. Now the alpha in Denver might not mean a whole lot, but we've already seen a young early on in his career. You always talk about, you want guys who break out early he did it in his second year. I know he's like a little bit later or older prospect, but like 24 years old, going to be 25 next year. He's clearly the better receiver when you compare him to Jerry Judy. No fan has kind of broken out, but I still think that he has cemented himself as the clear alpha in this offense. Wide receiver 24 might seem a bit lofty because there is always the downside of Drew Locke sticking around, the lack of touchdown upside with a guy like Cortland Sutton, but I'm betting on the talent there. I'm betting on the role that he's probably going to overtake when it is time for him to come back next season. And I just think the production we saw in year two could easily be replicated going forward if there is any sort of uh, improvement in the quarterback department in Denver. Yeah, I have I have a decent amount of court. So I was a big fan of him coming out of college. And I think, you know, when he got hurt this year, I was trying to make moves to get him. I wasn't able to get him in too many spots. People were kind of just holding on because those are rebuilding teams. But I would absolutely give up a first for Cortland Sutton. Um, I mean, he's kind of already proven – that he can be that top guy, that number one wide receiver. And that's what he'll be in that Denver Broncos offense. I think Jerry Drew is a great compliment to him, but you know, Cortland Sutton is going to be that dude. And Drew Locke is not the answer. Uh, I don't, I never thought that he was the answer. I mean, you know, maybe he has like a miraculous turnaround a la Josh Allen, but he doesn't have, have the, like... he doesn't have the legs that Josh Allen has either. And doesn't have the arm strength that Josh Allen has. I just don't really see it. I will say like, you know, whether he leaves next year or the year after that, I'm not sure. But even if he is there, I think the guy that's going to eat is Corlin Sutton because he's the one that can win the contested jump ball. Uh, Jerry Judy is, uh, I don't know. It looks he can't like he's win scared. an uncontested. It looks like he's scared. Ball. He just it looks like he's scared. Down. Yeah, it looks like he's scared to catch the ball uh, for the most part. He's a route god and all that stuff and get open. I'm, I'm sure he can. He's he's a great, by all means, like a great player, right? But Corlin Sutton is that dude and he's the one that I would rather have. In fact, if I could get Cortland Sutton for Jerry Judy, uh, I would do that today. I would even add a little bit on Jerry Judy. So I would definitely add a little bit add on top of uh, Kirk, Kirk, Christian Kirk as well. But I think I think Cortland Sutton's a great buy. I actually got him for Raheem Mostert uh, early on in the offseason when he got hurt. I remember that. And you're like, damn, I give up Raheem Mostert. And then Mostert got hurt like four more times. Like, it's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was a, I think that was a big W for me. I really need wide receivers. But if you can go out and acquire Cortland Sutton, it's going to be tough not to do it now just because – you know, there's no game for someone to trade them because if someone has them, they probably held them through the injury and they're probably rebuilding team anyways. And he's still a very young wide receiver. So I think you would take the same similar type of approach you should take with DJ Chark is when you're on the clock and, you know, people are looking at all these like Rashad Batemans and, you know, Rondell Moores and all these really stud wide receivers. You can flip one of those picks for Cortland Sutton plus. And I think that would be the move that I would do. Yeah. It seems like people get bored of players that 
I know he didn't like fall off because he got hurt, but like a Chris Godwin as well. Like he was the dynasty wide receiver one after last year and he had a down season. It's like, eh, are we really a fan of him anymore? I think Cortland Sutton kind of falls into that bucket. We forget how good he really was. And, you know, in the face of changing quarterback play, he was still productive throughout the entire season. So if you can go and buy him right now, uh, I would definitely go out and do it. Now, Mike, this next question comes from our man, OTAB, OTAB. If you take out the A, then that's like a message you'll get every two seconds in Dynasty, OTB, OTB. This guy's on the block. You can take him. I'm not sending offers. He asks, what is Joe Mixon's value in Dynasty? And Mike, I know you were a big fan of him, and yeah. I was a big fan as well. I'd like to hear your take on him because I think my take on Mixon might be a little bit different than consensus, might be different than yours as well. Yeah, I'd say he's had a very disappointing season. I mean, he got hurt. Um, he it was like there was a couple of bright spots that kind of like keep luring you back in. Like he had some games with like good target volume. He had that monster game with Jacksonville, obviously. Um, but even in other games, he was starting to see some of that target volume. And Joe Burrow got hurt. Then that entire offense took a shit. And then Joe Bernard, for whatever reason, like gets more work than Joe Mixon when when Joe Mixon is gone. It's really a puzzling case. I still think he's worth the first though. Like I would. I would definitely give up a 2021 first to get him like a mid even like uh, even like as soon as like some of those top running backs are gone, uh, like the Najee Harris and Travis Etienne, depending on where they land, maybe even ahead of them. Cause like, I, I, I'm like a, I guess I'm a sucker for talent because I think he is an extremely talented guy. And when he's given opportunity, he's kind of balled out a lot and he's a, he's a running back one when, when, when it all, when it's all said and done. Right. I mean, you guys actually offered me Joe Mixon. I think it was, um, uh, it was Yannick. Well, what time was the offer sent? Because it was any time past like 1 p.m. Eastern time, it was Yannick. Yeah, I think it was Yannick. He sent me an <laughs> offer of Joe Mixer for James Robinson. And it was like the week before like people thought that he would actually come back. And I was like, no, nah, I can't do that, man. Like, I, I need a starter and he might not come back. And it turns out he didn't come back. But that one made me think like James Robinson, Joe Mixon. I don't know if I'd do it again today, but like that one made me think because I'm still a believer in, in Joe Mixon. I, I don't think he's like that top five guy that we all thought and, and touted because he's shown, you know, year after year now where he just like, for whatever reason, Zach, uh, Zach Taylor is not giving him that, that volume. And it not, he's just not getting the work in the receiving game, which is mind boggling. But you know, if the coaching changes, they are going to probably draft more O-line because that team freaking stinks. Mm-hmm. So they add some more the guy line. Sewell or Sewell. I don't know how to fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy from yeah, Oregon P- who doesn't or whatever his name is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I think like they're going to boost that offensive line. I don't know where Gio is going to be next year either. So that's a question mark, but I would give up a mid middling first round pick for Joe Mixon. Okay, Mike. So I was right in the fact that we are very different on Joe Mixon. I love the talent too. I was looking back at this guy and I feel like Nick Whalen right now because I'm losing all faith in this poor kid. He's this, this sounds terrible to say he's my running back 19 in dynasty 19. Wow. It's crazy. But I was looking at his numbers, right? This year he had the one big game against Jacksonville. If you mm-hmm. look back through the past two seasons, guess how many games he scored 12 fantasy points of 22 games. Uh, How, how many games he scored 12 fantasy points? Well, that's like RB two numbers. Yeah. Um, Seven? 11. So like half the time he's a running back two for you. And he mm-hmm. has had those ceiling games. But when I just look at the context of the situation, right? We don't know if Joe Burrow is going to be back for like the first half or even like all of next year. He like had a Teddy Bridgewater type of injury, which kept him out of the league for a long time. And plus Teddy Bridgewater is not that good. So maybe Joe Burrow does come back next year. But what worries me about Joe Mixon is he's very talented, but the inconsistent usage, like in 2019, he was awful, basically unusable for the first half of the season because he was getting like 40% of the snaps. I know he didn't play like 60% of the snaps. Uh, I think he only played like eight games over 60% of the snaps. And like the first half of the year, he was a guy that people were asking, should I drop him? Just because the usage wasn't there. Yeah. And if Joe Burrow is going to be hurt and he's not getting consistent usage and the receiving game upside isn't there, it's a low scoring offense without their starting quarterback. I just think 2021 might be not a completely wasted season because you can probably still get volume out of him and some usage as an RB2. But if you're getting RB2 production out of a guy who's going to be 24, then being 25 and the quarterback finally comes back and maybe their offensive line isn't completely solidified. And even if it is, like we haven't seen him consistently hit his stride and hit his peak and, you know, be surrounded by a coaching staff that wants to use him over and over, it just gives me some worry. And that's why I have a guy like Aaron Jones, who's an undrafted or an unrestricted free agent this offseason. We don't know where he's going to go, but. We've seen him be productive and very efficient on limited touches, which we haven't seen out of Joe Mixon. So I feel like I'd rather have the, although it's unknown with Aaron Jones, I'd rather have 
the known production out of a limited, a potentially limited role this offseason. And looking at other guys I have ahead of them, you know, Josh Jacobs, Miles Sanders, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, Ezekiel Elliott. So it's not like I ranked them behind bums. I think the only like bum I ranked them behind would be David Montgomery. But I think David Montgomery this year is having a very similar season to what Joe Mixon did last year, where it's a tale of two halves where the first half stinks. The second half is really good. And I think that the situation in Chicago will be a little bit more fluid this year to next year than what's going to happen in Cincinnati, because I'm not sure if Trubisky is their guy, but if he's not their guy, that means that they're probably going to get a good quarterback. Whereas Cincinnati is not going to really invest heavily in that position to fill it for half a season or full season. So I'm a little bit lower on Joe Mixon, but I'm not going to give him up for anything less than a first because he still does carry that name value. And he still does carry the value of a workhorse running back, although his usage doesn't really suggest that all the time. Um, but I agree with you, like Travis Etienne, Najee Harris, I definitely take ahead of him. And depending where Javante Williams goes, I'd maybe take him ahead of Mixon and Dynasty too. So uh, I think that was like a good blend of opinions because you're a little bit higher than maybe some are. And I'm probably lower than a lot of people are. But we're actually very similar in terms of our ranks. I have him as RB18. So, oh, really? Yeah, so we're not that similar. It's not that dissimilar. I just meant like, I mean, I wouldn't give him for, for less than a mid milling first just because you can't buy that type of volume. Does that uh, sound terrible else. though? Saying like RB eighteen because like season yeah. long like RB eighteen sounds awful, but like yeah, but it's like you know it, we had like literally like five running backs jump into like the top fifteen and mm-hmm. rookies, right? So it's like you know you got J.K. Dobbins, uh, DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, Clyde Zolaire, uh, Antonio Gibson, James Robinson, like six, right? You had like freaking six running backs jump in. So it sounds bad, but you know I like to put the young guys up earlier than earlier than later. So yep. And following that up, we have a guy asking about the 101. Dab K asks, he has two stud young QBs in the 101 Superflex. Should he trade one of his current quarterbacks, Kyler Murray or Lamar, trade the 101, or just take T-Law and trade one of them later, slash take the extra QB depth? I'm a fan of having a lot of assets. Like if I had a million dollars and somebody's like, do you want another million? I'm not going to be like, okay, let me give this million away to get another million. I know it's not a perfect analogy, but... I think right now you just hold that 101, you hold Kyler, you hold Lamar. Because even if mm-hmm. Kyler ends the season shitty, his value isn't going to decline because he's a 23-year-old quarterback that's putting up top three quarterback numbers. Lamar Jackson's quarterback uh, value kind of fell this year, but now it's starting to pick back up and people are like, okay, this guy's a legit top five dynasty quarterback, maybe even top three again. The 101, we just saw how valuable the 101 got because it just went from T-Law to the Jets to T-Law to the Jacksonville Jaguars, which we just covered, is somebody that we're going to be a huge fan of. So I don't see the value of any three of those things dipping. So for me, it might sound like a cop-out, but I just hold all three and then just wait and get a King's Ransom for any of them. Maybe flip Trevor Lawrence, Kyler, or uh, Lamar Jackson, get a quarterback in return, and then get a whole bunch on top, like a Kirk Cousins, and then get like two 2021 firsts and a player, which is probably like a crazy return, but I don't think it's unrealistic given these guys' talents and their dual threat ability. So I would just hold on to it right now, ride it out, and get as much as you can for it, which will be a ton given their talent. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Like, you just take them. Like, these are – it's liquid currency. You know, Trevor Lawrence, I mean, you're going to get a, a treasure chest of assets for him from someone. There's going to be someone in your league who believes that he is the best quarterback prospect since – hall of famer so whatever whatever whoever that person is like when you're on the clock either trade back if you want trade down but if you can't take him and trade him later because if he does turn out to be really good if he has a if he has a joe burrow-esque rookie season justin herbert-esque rookie season you, you like just look at how much wrote justin herbert's going for today like you, and you, if you have all these young guys and he said he had dak too right uh, I'm not. No, he had Lamar and Kyler. Okay, yeah, that. okay, Lamar and Kyler. And also, you should you should always have three quarterbacks in Superflex. You shouldn't just be swinging the lawn with two. Man, my quarterback gets- three, the league I'm in the championship right now. My quarterback three was Alex Smith and Ryan Fitzpatrick, which somehow managed to like <laughs> the puzzle pieces together. But then my two stars are Kyler and Josh Allen. So I've kind of yeah, wrote it exactly. Subject, it's fine, and and you can you can you I would draft them, hold them, and then you can like trade down or flip them for whatever you want. But like it's easy to trade stud quarterbacks, especially guys who are Konami codes like Lamar Jackson, like Kyler Murray, like Trevor Lawrence, who is a sneaky. I'm not even say sneaky. That's kind of racist because he's white. He's actually pretty fast. And he's, just, <laughs> he's just he's just a good player. He's not sneaky. He's a, he's just a good running quarterback and a good throwing quarterback. He's there's nothing sneaky about it. He's a, you know he's on par with Justin Fields. They're both great dual threat quarterbacks. Trevor Lawrence just happens to have a better arm. So I would just absolutely take him. Do not pass on him though for like Najee Harris, even though Najee Harris is a baller. Do not pass on him for Travis Etienne. 
because I think you honestly will be able to trade him for like a Travis Etienne, Najee Harris plus. There is no, there isn't a Jonathan Taylor type prospect in this class that I would take over QB. Even if Jonathan Taylor was in this class, it'd be a tough call. I'd probably still take Jonathan Taylor, but it'd be a much closer call. But we don't have that in this class. So you don't have to worry about that. Just take those stud quarterbacks first and then worry about it later and trade for it later. Yep. And another quarterback question. This one will be quick because I feel it's a pretty easy sentiment to get across. A-N-D, 3-H asks, and a qu- two quarterback with a super flex, so possible three quarterbacks in the lineup. He has Teddy two gloves, Brady two of its magic, Josh Allen. Should I think about dropping Fitz Magic for someone like Jordan Love? I'll just say drop somebody who isn't a quarterback for Jordan Love. I know Ryan Fitzpatrick's time in the league might be done, but we also thought his time in the league was done like 18 years ago, and he's still somehow drawing starts. I would just say in a league where you can start three quarterbacks, you can never have enough potential starters. I'm surprised Jordan Love is on the wire. Sure, he's behind Aaron Rodgers, and sure, he might not be good at quarterback, But guess what? We just thought the same exact thing with Jalen Hurts. We thought he was never going to see the field because Carson Wentz was so good at football. Wrong. The guy fucking stinks. And now Jalen Hurts is a top 10 quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is having a complete bounce back season. He looks incredible. The guy's also 38 years old. We've seen a guy like Drew Brees and a guy like Tom Brady kind of fall off the map. And I'm not saying Aaron Rodgers is close to falling off the cliff as those guys were these past few seasons. But Jordan Love, like all it takes is one more injury to Aaron Rodgers. He slots in the starting quarterback. What if he shows out? What if he plays like Jalen Hurts does? If he's not going to be the guy in Green Bay, somebody might just want to pay King's ransom and get Jordan Love on their team. So anytime you can get a realistically, a realistic starting quarterback like a Jordan Love who has a maybe like a, a roundabout track to becoming a starter but had the talent to be a first-round pick, anytime you can get that off the waiver wire, do whatever it takes to get them. If you have like legit nobody else to drop because they're all startable candidates and your worst players like Miles Gaskin outside of your quarterbacks, I'm fine dropping Fitzmagic. I would just say do whatever it takes to get that quarterback on your roster. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with pretty much everything you just said. We have our last set of questions, all from the same guy, Albert R. Lee. I think we'll start with this one because I it's pretty easy and I know you're a big stand. He asks, should we be, should we be moving off of Tannehill after this season due to age if we were able to do so? Ryan Tannehill is 32 years old. I'm not sure if this guy thinks he's like 40, but Ryan Tannehill is very good. And it's not like he relies on his arm throwing it 95 yards down the field all the time. And even if he is, like we've seen Aaron Rodgers do it. But then again, like he's not relying on his arm all too much. He's like 15th, 16th and a dot. He has guys that are young and can produce after the catch, whether it's John Smith, who's kind of fallen off the map, but like AJ Brown, Derek Henry out of the backfield, hopefully Corey Davis is back. And even if they, they don't bring him back, I think this offense has shown to be built around a very efficient play style, whether it's handing the ball off to, to Derek Henry 25 times, basically bringing them into the red zone or the end zone almost every drive. I see no reason to get off the Tannehill train. Mike, please do not bring up the fact that I took Cam, uh, Cam Newton over Ryan Tannehill in one of the trade deals. It was like week two. I was all in on the Cam Newton hype. But uh, yeah, to me, he's like an easy top 12, top 15 dynasty quarterback. I don't care about his age. He's a dual threat guy that has shown two years back to back to be a legit quarterback one. Yeah, the good thing about Ryan Tannehill is not only is he a good fantasy quarterback, he is a great real-life NFL okay. quarterback. If you look at his advanced metrics like EPA, uh, completion percentage over expected, all these things, he has been the top of the league. In fact, last year he was number one when he took over. And this I year, remember la- this past offseason when we were talking about possible regression, we are like, okay, this offense might take a step back, but they'll throw more. Turns out they just maintain their their success in the red zone. I know you talked about, oh, they scored like 80% of the time they're in the red zone. Last year, 75% of the time they're in the red zone, they scored a touchdown. This year, 77%. They're the only team to go back-to-back over 70% in 2019 and 2020. This offense is ridiculous. Whatever Arthur Smith is doing there, give him a fucking pat on the back because this offense has continued to be very efficient, very successful, despite leaning on the run, which everybody on Twitter says is a bad thing to do. Turns out when you have Derrick Henry, that really does establish the run and allows you to get find success and play action, which they've done for two straight years now. So uh, sorry to cut you off, but I just had to expand on the point that Ryan Tannehill is extremely efficient. He's good in real life, and he basically has that job secured for, what, three more seasons? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of it. Like, you want to get guys who are really good in real life and really good in fantasy. And, and you know, those guys usually cost you an arm and a leg. But Ryan Tannehill has been very affordable this offseason. He'll probably continue to be affordable. Be- the fact that you're asking this question, like, you're not alone. Like, everyone will, will think this. Like, hey, he's, he's getting older. Uh, you know, he's falling off, whatever. But we just saw what Aaron Rodgers did at, like, age 36. Uh, and I was totally wrong about him. You know, we got Russell Wilson, same age as Ryan Tannehill. 
And Ryan Tannehill has been, you know, putting, dropping it in a bucket while Russell Wilson and the let Russ cook movement has fucking taken a dump in the past few weeks. So, I mean, you tell me who you'd rather have rest of the season uh, for the championship match. Would you rather have Russell Wilson against LA Rams or Ryan Tannehill against, uh, who, I don't even know who they're playing, but it doesn't somebody. matter. I'll take Tannehill. It's a kick matchup. But yeah, I mean, look, he is a stud. He, he signed for a long-term contract. He's been doing this without Taylor Lewan, who's going to be back next year and be a great addition back for that offense. I don't think you should be selling on Ryan Tannehill, uh, selling high because he's old, because he's not. Like quarterbacks have a longer shelf life. And the reason why, you know, you play quarterback and, and people want to go in all in the quarterback position early is because they can have him for 10 years. And the reason why I don't care about that is because I can get guys like Ryan Tannehill for the next three to five and just serve me just fine. So don't rush to sell Ryan Tannehill. I don't think you're going to get value from him. He's not someone... He's someone where, where production is going to be greater than his trade value. And mm-hmm. when you're in those instances, you keep him. And the only, the only I guess, you know, caveat to that is if you're in like a deep rebuild and you got to like get rid of him, then yeah, for sure, trade him. But don't don't look to sell him for a discount or sell high just because he's 32 years old. Yeah, and do you feel the same sentiments for Corey Davis, which is he also asks about, is he worth keeping or should be selling after the offseason because they didn't pick up his fifth-year option? I think we covered this a few times in the recent weeks about him potentially going to like Green Bay, Houston, or wherever. I honestly think with how good he's looked in Tennessee this past season, I wouldn't be surprised if they re-sign him. I mean, that that dynamic of having him, A.J. Brown, Jonu Smith, and Derrick Henry in the backfield, like having these physical guys that can block like a Corey Davis, like an A.J. Brown can, as well as win after the catch, I see no reason to not shell out some good cash from it. I'm not sure about the cap situation, but if they can afford to pay him, I see no reason to let him walk. And even if he does walk, I think what he's shown this year is he's – not an elite receiver, but he's a, he's a rung below it. And he's on pace for like 1200 yards, seven, eight touchdowns. He's having the season that Devonte Parker had last year and people were selling him off for like first round picks. If you can get a first round pick for Corey Davis, I'd probably do it. But if you can't get, you know, at least a high two, I would just hold on because I think his talent is certainly there. Although, you know, it took a little bit for him to break out. You got to realize like Marcus Mariota wasn't doing anybody any favors in Tennessee. And by the time they got a good quarterback, AJ Brown kind of cemented himself as their guy. So uh, I think what he's shown is he's definitely worth a high end rookie pick. And if you can't get that in return, I would just hold it out for Corey Davis because there aren't many situations where I could see his value falling off the map unless he goes to like the Jets. I don't see his value completely tanking. And even if he does go to the Jets or a team like the Jets, like we saw fucking Brashad Perriman gain dynasty value for breaking out for three games. Whereas Corey Davis has broken out for, it's about to be like 16 now. And I don't see a situation as bad as the Jets out there. So uh, I'm a big fan of Corey Davis. I'm going to hold if I can't get good value in return. And if he does stay in Tennessee, he's going to be a guy that I'm going to go out and try to buy if people are trying to sell high in him. Yeah. Yeah, I think Corey Davis is a, is a decent buy. I mean, we talked about him a little bit on the last episode as well. He is that guy who who's a who's a pretty good number two option. And he's, you know, we say all the time that this game is mental, right? This game is mental. He came, came into the league as the fourth overall pick, load of pressure on his shoulders, got hurt, was not great for his first four years. He, in comes a younger model, AJ Brown, totally shows him up. But this year... By all accounts, he's been like nearly as productive as AJ Brown has, um, both from a just pure counting stats perspective, but also from like an efficiency and an advanced metrics perspective. He's been really good. He's had a really, really good season. He, he is still young, and I would absolutely be fine with buying back in on Corey Davis. Um, and like you said, they might resign him because he is that, you know, he's a big physical receiver and really falls in the MO and the way they run their team. But even if they don't resign him, I think there's a couple of teams out there that, that could use them, you know, namely, you know, like the Green Bay Packers, for example, right? Um, honestly, even like, even the Falcons could use them, uh, to be honest with you. Like, you know, Julio's aging a little bit and Calvin Ridley's kind of ascending to that to that alpha role and having Corey Davis an option there would be would be a pretty good one. I think a sneaky yeah. place could be Washington too. If they get a quarterback and him and Terry McLaurin, that would be pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good too. Yeah, how about David Montgomery, the man of the hour, the guy who has had this crazy second half breakout. He's like the RB1 over the past however many weeks. Is he somebody that you see as a must sell on Twitter? I think I saw you actually tweet at somebody like, well, it depends what you can get in return for David Montgomery. But where where do you value him now after seeing what his ceiling is, although it's against like shitty defenses? Like, where do you value him uh, amongst dynasty running backs, given his age and given his recent outburst? 
yeah, I mean, he's been extremely productive. You know, he's done it against bad teams. So I'm not going to hold that against him. Jonathan Taylor has been doing it against bad teams too, but he has looked Man, I uh, tweeted that better. and people got upset at me. They were like tweeting me his, oh, he ran a 4-6-3. I'm like, I don't see how his 40 time has anything to do with the teams he's playing against. Like, yeah, both guys are breaking out in the second half of the season against shitty teams. We're not holding Jonathan. We're not holding against Jonathan Taylor, so why hold it against David Montgomery? Yeah, we shouldn't. I mean, I tweeted before Jonathan Taylor won his breakout. I said, look, he has a stretch of games coming up against really bad teams, and if Jonathan Taylor flops here, it's going to be really hard to stick behind him. And obviously he didn't flop. He did. He improved. He, he rose to the occasion. Um, not only did he do really well statistically, but he looked like a much better runner, right? He built that confidence. And we always say it, like, it's mental, dude, it's mental. You can't building confidence is actually, you know, it's unquantifiable and I can't measure it and I can't like prove it anyway, but I really feel like that has a big impact on these players that, that they know they can do it. It's like, Hey, look, I'm doing it against real life NFL teams. And you know, maybe it's a bad matchup. Maybe it's an easy matchup. I don't give a fuck. Like if you're doing it against NFL teams, you belong on the field. So I'm not going to discount David Montgomery because even when someone said that he was playing against bad teams, I still was very hesitant to go in on David Montgomery. I was still very concerned if he could actually do what he's doing here. And obviously he's getting the volume. My one main concern is what happens when Tariq Cohen comes back. Um, if he starts eating to the little bit of that receiving volume, that might be bad. And also what happens when Trubisky leaves? Because I think Trubisky, as shitty of a quarterback as he is, he has been positive, a plus for David Montgomery because he has created the space. A running quarterback will create that space for you, and no one needs more space than David Montgomery. Like he's great at breaking tackles, but he's never been able to do anything after it because he doesn't have the explosiveness and the athleticism to kind of do anything after it. But with Tr Mitchell Trubisky there creating that space for him, I think he's been able to do a little bit more. He's improved as a runner, so I do like him. Similarly to like uh, a Joe Mixon or whatever, I, I don't think I would want to give him up for anything less than a first. I'm still going to take the top, probably the top two, maybe even the top three, including Javante William, rookie running backs ahead of them. I'm probably going to have a couple of the young stud wide receivers like Jamar Chase ahead of him as well. But I would not be selling him for anything less than a first, uh, even if you don't believe in David Montgomery, because the market dictates, like, don't sell for below market. I think the market offer is a first for him and potentially even a first plus if you can find one of those, like, super David Montgomery truthers from like the early on when people had him ranked ahead of like Josh Jacobs and, and Miles Sanders and all that, but he has been very productive. He is, he has definitely lived up to the hype and he is not a bust. Even before this breakout, he has lived up to what his draft capital indicates. And he was a third round pick and what he's done a hundred thousand yards from scrimmage in his rookie year, you know, well, well on pace to be over that this year. So he's by no means a bust. And I would definitely prefer him to a lot of these like older guys. And, you know, I have him in that, range with like the you know like the austin ecklers and and the joe mixons and i got like kareem hunt and, and ronald jones and guys like that after him but yeah like that is fucking a wild i'm looking at my course. rankings literally word for word dave montgomery mixon eckler hunt and then ronald jones <laughs> yeah. right afterwards yeah so that's kind of where i have um a lot of these guys ranked so yeah i would definitely not sell cheap um am i am i like all in now no uh, I acquired most of my Dave Montgomery shares this off season when he was super cheap, when everyone was just dumping on him because I thought it was a good volume play. And, and, you know, that's kind of paying off a little bit for me carrying my team in the playoffs, but I would not, I'm not like all in, but I'm also not like a, Hey, you got to get out of this guy right now. Cause he stinks. Cause I think he's proven a lot over these past few weeks, even if it's against uh, lower tier run defenses. Yeah. And definitely don't sell him like right now. I know it's enticing that, Oh, I can get a first run right now. His next two matchups are green Bay and Jacksonville. I don't know who made this schedule, probably the NFL. Whoever made this schedule wanted David Montgomery to break out. Whoever made this schedule has David Montgomery on their dynasty team and had plans of selling him this offseason. So if you are going to sell him, wait until after this stretch ends because he could realistically put up, what, like six, seven, eight straight 20-point fantasy games, which is something that nobody has really done this season. He's showing that he can hold up with these touches. And I have a bold take, and I'm not sure how bold it's really going to be, but I'm not sure that Chicago moves off of Trubisky. Like, they were, what, they started like five and zero, but they were two and zero with him. Then they benched him their third game because he threw one pick. They were just finding any reason to sit him. He comes back and this offense is putting up like thirty points. I know it's against bad defenses, but uh, they haven't looked completely awful with him there. I know last week he had a pretty down game, but he also threw like a red zone interception where he was trying to force it to Allen Robinson, which I don't necessarily hate to see. So. I think I agree with you a lot. He's like my RB 18, 19 for me. He's not moving into my top 10 or top 12 just because I feel like there's so many other guys that are not only younger than him, but have continued to flash and flash at an earlier point than him. But it's definitely promising to see. He's broken off a pretty, like a bunch of pretty long runs. Like he had an 80 yard touchdown run. He had like a 50 something yarder against Green yep. Bay. So although he's not this breakaway speed type of guy, he's flashed the potential to 
at least have that type of upside every other week or so. So he's somebody that I am definitely getting a little bit higher on. I'm not going to overpay for him, but at the same time, I'm not going to try to sell him cheap or try to sell high on him because I think the price people are going to pay is still a little bit below where he needs to be. Now, somebody in the last part of this question, the last question in this video, somebody who rose up my rankings because of their recent stretch, and I'm sure he did for you as well. You call him the prodigal son, Cam Akers, where he ranks in terms of dynasty. He's my running back 10. And to me, although it was like very, it was a small flash because now he's injured and he's out for this week and maybe the rest of the season, it depends uh, with his ankle sprain or whatever ended up happening. Although it was a very small flash and it was like a two game sample of him being really good, the commitment that Sean McVay showed was almost unlike any other rookie running back in this class. Only him and James Robinson were players that had back-to-back -back games of 20 plus carries. It's like an arbitrary number because I'm pretty sure Jonathan Taylor's had like 15 plus every game. But it's good to know that a team that wants to run the ball trusts Cam Akers to run the ball. And although they had Malcolm Brown, who they trusted a lot, and Daryl Henderson, who was, you know, PFF's golden boy, who was like extremely elusive for like two games or whatever, the fact that they've basically become non factors in this offense in favor of a running back who started off the season terribly, got injured, and then came back and was the third option, rose his way to the top and now is out touching them immensely. I think all that shows is an extreme amount of confidence in Cam Akers. We know he has a three down skill set. He started to kind of flash at this season. And I also like this offense because Sean McVay has shown he is willing to adapt and play to his player strengths. And he gave Cam Akers like 29 touches one week, 29 rushes one week, uh, 20 rushes another week. I think he's going to do whatever it takes next season as well to get the ball in Cam Akers' hands. And for as bad as offensive line looked on paper, they've actually played pretty well and they've found a way to get Robert Woods and Josh Reynolds and a bunch of tight ends on the field to get this run game going. So he's somebody that I'm completely bought in on. He's a top 10 dynasty running back for me. And when we look at the incoming class, I think only Najee Harris is somebody who has potential to jump him because I think the talent uh, is definitely there and the landing spot we know is already there. And I think they've shown more commitment to him than Daryl Henderson to this point. Yeah, I think uh, I tweeted this out earlier, but Cam Akers percentage of backfield carries uh, week 13 to week 15, 78%, 94%, 88%. If you look at his total opportunities, which is carries plus targets over the last three weeks, 69%, very nice, 75%, 82%. In that time, he's averaging 24 opportunities per game. Henderson and Brown are both at sub 3.5. And like they're it's it's basically their wash now. Um, we we predicted this. We said Cam Akers would take over that backfield because he is talented, but he's raw. So you have to wait, wait a little bit longer than I would have liked, but he's definitely gotten there. And now he's hurt again, which kind of stinks, obviously. But it's it's kind of clear to me who the workhorse and who the guy is in that backfield. And Cam Akers, like that last game, the stats do not tell the whole story. He had a 20-yard touchdown uh, run that got called back for holding uh, where he like broke a bunch of tackles. He had a 40-yard run where he broke like three or four tackles in the same run. Like that's what he does. Like he is a souped up version of David Montgomery because he has a lot of juice after he breaks a tackle, but he has that same tackle breaking ability. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big, big fan of Cam Akers. I tried to buy low on him this, uh, this season when he was like having that down stretch, nobody was biting. Unfortunately, I was trying to offer like seconds and like late first and like other types of like package deals for him. And I just wasn't able to get him. Luckily I drafted a bunch of them. So I have a shitload of Cam Akers. So that's, that's a positive, but I think it's going to be really good. Malcolm Brown probably gone after the season, right? And Darrell Henderson. Look, I mean, I'm sure he's a good football player, but he's just not. He's just not that guy, and he he can be that guy that give you a couple burst plays. He definitely deserves to be on the field um, with Cam Makers, but this is Cam Makers' world now. We're all just fucking living in it from now on. <laughs> yeah, I actually made two trades for Cam Makers. One of them was for a rookie pick that turned into Cam Makers. I thought I lost the deal at the time. We'll we'll get your live verdict, Mike. I traded this offseason Devontae Parker and Christian McCaffrey in a super flex league for DK Metcalf, Josh Allen, Joe Mixon, and the rookie 106, which turned into Cam Makers. Yeah, love that. That's and then in the hole. I know. I, I remember I brought it up at the time. You're like, wow, you guys, you did not get enough for him because we thought Devonta Parker would be legit. And I think that's yeah. kind of like shown he isn't. Another one was I know this guy watches every single week. So, Justin, shout out you. I sent an offer. I was giving him the, I think it's going to end up being 111 or 112 because he's in the finals or maybe like 10, 110, 111, whatever it is. Late first round pick for Cam Akers and that same guy's second round pick. So, late second Cam Akers for late first. It was out there for like three weeks. I'm like, okay, he just didn't see it. He accepted it randomly one day and he's like, I bet you forgot that I was out there. I'm like, you're goddamn right. And then the very next week was the day that they handed the keys over to Cam Akers. So 
now I'm living pretty. Um, Shout out you, Justin. I'm really appreciative that you tried to finagle me and then I'm coming right back at you. I know you're the commissioner of that league, so you can boot me whenever you want. And Nick Whalen would have very bad things to say about it. But uh, (laughs) I'm, I'm appreciative that you hit the accept button. And I think, you know, it just, it tells a story that you kind of have to not risk it because Cam Akers hadn't really done anything up to that point. But if you really believe in the talent of a player and the draft capital is there and you see a path to touches, don't be afraid to maybe potentially lose a trade, but the the value can potentially get out of it. If the upside hits that it's immense, I would go out there and make that type of trade any day of the week. And I would do it again, even if Cam Akers ends up turning into a pumpkin like Daryl Henderson in the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, is that the last one? Yeah, I think it is. Awesome. That's all we got for you guys. Discord questions from the folks. Thanks for contributing this week. Uh, if you liked the content, if you liked the answers, even if you didn't, subscribe. Don't <laughs> thumbs up, but subscribe. Maybe you'll maybe you'll find some more content down the line that you do enjoy. Uh, we do try our best to kind of you know inform you guys and give you a little bit of a different approach uh, than a lot of the other fantasy stuff out there. We're just trying to make you think a different way. And you know we're gonna have a lot of bad takes, man. I'm telling you, we're gonna we're oh, gonna do that freezing cold takes. takes. Looking back, I don't think oh. we've had any good ones. Bad takes only on this channel. We're gonna have a freezing cold takes episode. That one's gonna be fun to go through for sure. Uh, but yeah, subscribe, like, follow Noah, follow me, follow Nick, follow the BDG squad, and uh, engage with us on Twitter. You know, you're gonna get a lot of content. You're gonna get you're gonna get me dumping on Nick Will, and you're gonna get FB God dunking on himself. It's gonna be a good time. It's going to be a good time. So uh, that's all we got for you guys, man. Peace. Peace.